We've made it to the less uh, scientific part of the evening. Uh, this next presentation includes zero slides of the human brain. <laughs> it also includes no earwax. That's just something Virginia's into. But, <laughs> we love her. So if you could have any superpowers, which would you choose? When I was growing up, I had two go-to superpowers. Uh, one, being able to speak every language on the planet. And the other, being able to remember every name of every person I ever met. Those seem like pretty banal superpowers for a kid to dream of, unless your brain is wired like mine. My name is Ann Browning, I'm an Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health with the Global Brain Health Institute at UCSF, where I have the distinction of being GBHI's only monolingual fellow. <laughs> I am also the founding director of the University of Washington Resilience Lab, and I serve as the Assistant Dean for Wellbeing with the UW School of Medicine. Those superpowers I dreamt of cut right to my vulnerabilities and my weaknesses. We've just heard Virginia talk about dyslexia and emotions in children. I'll add some texture to her research and I'll share a bit about my own lived experience as a kid with dyslexia. Growing up, I was always a back row kid. That's me with the ridiculous red bow towering above the rest of my kindergarten class. My stature made my struggles somehow more visible, more pronounced. I remember frequently being pulled out of class for hallway language assessments that never yielded a clear diagnosis. By the third grade, I remember having to leave my fourth grade classroom and descend a set of stairs down to, uh, or excuse me, down to the second grade classroom hallway for remedial reading classes where I had to fit my already oversized femurs under tiny, tiny desks. I felt awkward and out of place perpetually in school and at home among a family of academic high achievers. In the fourth grade, I had a breakthrough. At about 10 years of age, we predominantly shift from reading phonetically by sounding words out to reading by shape recognition. Within a year, I went from the remedial reading group to kind of placing highest on and getting the top scores on our standardized testing. Sweet. Problem solved. I managed to survive under the radar until about 12th grade, living in absolute fear of being called on to read aloud in class, of being found out. And then Hamlet happened. I was called on to read a passage, and I had no idea what I was saying. I just tried to read a word at a time. Shape recognition failed me as the subtle differences between Shakespearean English and standard English proved too big a gap for my compensation skills to leap. I just read words that looked like the words on the page. I finished, there was silence. The next student began and then there was a request to stay after class. The vague recollection of being asked if I had been tested for learning disabilities, my greatest vulnerabilities exposed. And the rest I just remember as red. Somehow I was connected in with an external tester. I was a unicorn at that disability testing center, a high schooler about to graduate and head to Harvard among a sea of adolescent angst, behavioral and academic challenges. And then a new thing happened. The person who did my evaluation, Betty, looked at me and said, you must be incredibly gifted to have compensated so well in the academic environment. You must have some incredible strengths. I hadn't heard that before. After hours of testing, the results uh, show that I have a serious auditory processing deficiency, but that my shape recognition is off the charts. Then Betty gave me some incredible advice that has shaped how I move forward. And in all honesty, honesty, it changed the trajectory of my life. She said, your brain is wired differently than others. Leverage your strengths and work on your weaknesses. Address them rather than avoid them. And that was a gift. That gift gave me the permission of embracing thinking differently than others rather than trying to fit in with them. To being open to seeing pathways forward that are unconventional or unseen by many. 
One of my heroes growing up was a master of divergent thinking, MacGyver. <laughs> For those of you who didn't grow up steeped in American TV culture, MacGyver was some sort of oddly under-resourced special agent that kept getting himself into sticky situations. This guy managed to shut down a nuclear reaction using a chocolate bar and a paper clip. <laughs> he was so good at seeing the possibility in problem solving that he himself has become a verb to MacGyver something. It means to leverage a few resources into brilliant fixes. What's fascinating is we all start off as tiny MacGyvers. Our brains start as open systems that thrive on free association. But over time, our pathways become more established, and there's this process of kind of pruning back these unused connections that takes place throughout our childhood. Russian psychologist Leo Vygotsky studied children's use of items in play and noticed this kind of creative and divergent thinking in cognitive development. A broom to a kid could be a horse to ride, a sword to wield, a bridge to cross. As we age, we lose that creativity. At some point, we just see a broom with which to sweep. In psychology, this is known as functional fixedness, which is basically the opposite of creative or divergent thinking. Functional fixedness is a cognitive bias that limits a person to use an object only in the way it's been traditionally used. A broom becomes useful for sweeping, a chocolate bar to eat, a paper clip to hold together our sales report, and suddenly we're not MacGyvering any nuclear reactors. Functional fixedness also serves to limit our perception of what is possible around us. It limits our situational awareness. When rock star violinist Joshua Bell played wildly beautiful and complex music for 45 minutes during a rush hour in a Washington DC metro station as part of a social experiment to see what people would do, only a handful of folks stopped. One of them was a three-year-old boy who paused and just stared at the virtuoso before eventually being tugged forward by a parent. Bell had just played to a sold out concert the evening before in town, but in this new context, what people heard could not override their contextual perception of where they were and where they needed to be. The three-year-old could tell that this violinist was different, but the adults struggled. Tonight, I invite you to listen with the newness and curiosity of a three-year-old who stops in the metro station. Allow yourself to connect the music to emotion and see what thoughts and connections emerge. I still have plenty of struggles. Importantly, over time, I've learned to give myself permission to not be perfect, to try things, to take risks, to make mistakes, to fail, and to meet those errors not with embarrassment, but with radical acceptance. This has led me to developing the type of kindness and compassion for others in their navigation of imperfection. And it's also led me to having a good amount of resilience and compassion for myself. Resilience and compassion for others lets us live at the edge of our abilities. And that's where our learning and our growth lies. This notion of how we treat others shapes how we connect to others. How we treat ourselves shapes how we connect to others. In my work, I look at the emotional states and well-being of healthcare professionals and how that shapes the ways in which they interact with patients, especially the most vulnerable among us. As great thinkers have said, at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did, but they will remember how you made them feel. I can still remember some of what Betty said to me almost 25 years ago, but even more importantly, I can tell you that she made me feel seen. So the next time you feel stuck and frustrated, staring at a dead end, I encourage you to get in touch with your inner MacGyver and think creatively and kindly about the world around you so that you can see all of the paths in front of you. The superpowers I wanted when I was a kid uh, pointed to my weaknesses and my vulnerabilities, things that I continue to lean into and work on. What I do have is the power to see the bigger picture, to see people in their full humanity, and to meet challenges setbacks and failures we all face with infinite possibilities. And that has proven to be an incredible superpower.
Thank you.